Middle America and the world. My name is Dan Petrie, and many of you might remember me as a seven-year all-star pitcher from 11 to 18 from Vandenberg Village, California, Lompoc Valley, and a three-year letterman for Cabrillo High School, where I made the varsity at only 14 years old, a sophomore. I was also all-league at 14, as well as my junior and senior years, as well as MVP of the team my freshman year and my junior year. Although I had a 24-year sports career, many people remember me for the 1976 Northern League Championship game, where as a 16-year-old junior, I beat crosstown rival Lompoc 1-0 to win the Northern League Championship. The past 21 years, I've been a professional entertainer, a singer. So I've been in the public eye for over 45 years. In college, I studied administration of justice, English, and music business management. I am also a victim of at least three federal civil rights crimes, in my opinion, at the hand of some of the most corrupt police officers in the history of mankind right here on the central coast of California. My show, Cops, as many of you have told me over the years, does COPS stand for a criminal organization, plain and simple? This show is dedicated to every victim of a police crime there ever was, not criminals. In my first show, I will be replaying excerpts of my interview with Mr. William J. Wagner of On Second Thought, who was the first journalist to let me tell my horror story on dealing with the police and the actual police crimes I'm a victim of in detail publicly. I will then have some other victims of police crime come on and tell their horror stories. An ex-police officer who went undercover and was lucky to make it out alive. Teresa Smith, a mother who lost her son, Cesar Ray Cruz. Mr. Ron Thomas, an ex-cop, father of Mr. Kelly Thomas, a 135-pound mentally ill homeless man who was brutally beaten to death and showed no mercy by the Fullerton Six, Manuel Ramos, Jay Ciccinelli, Joe Wolf, Kevin Craig, James Bladney, and Kevin Hampton. Ramos, Ciccinelli, Wolf have now been charged in the case. The other three are being allowed to return to work. Unbelievable. Many people in the community of Fullerton, including myself, are outraged. <clears throat> you can access the 33-minute bus stop video of the actual beating, which starts at around the 15-minute mark, on YouTube. Just search the Kelly Thomas case out of Fullerton, California, and there are many videos covering the entire case. Including the upcoming trials, which could take as long as 18 months, on a crime which happened over a year and a half ago. When the paramedics arrived, some police officers wanted their minor scrapes attended to first, while Kelly lies in a near-death-like coma in the gutter. Kelly actually died in the ambulance but was revived and died four days later in the hospital where Ron took the now worldwide picture of his arrested from the neck up son, as he said and I said, disgusting. If some police are going to beat Mr. Kelly Thomas to death with cameras recording them, how many Kellys are not on video? They and more victims would like to be guests on my show. Every TV show on the police you have ever watched is all propaganda, in my opinion. My goal is to clean up the law enforcement community in the nation by exposing what many of you have always felt. Are the police just a part of organized crime? Why do I have to do this? Because the law enforcement community obviously will not clean themselves up. <coughs> Did you know that there are police gangs called the Regulators and the Jump Out Boys? 
I want them disbanded now. I stand behind everything I say 100%. In August, I stood beside Mr. William Wagner when he presented an affidavit to the Santa Barbara Board of Supervisors seeking to indict Tom Snedden, Ron Zonin, Gordon Auchincloss, and Magna Cola for allegedly fabricating fingerprint evidence in the Michael Jackson trial and some phone records. They committed at least three felonies in trying to convict one of the most famous people in the history of the world, Michael Jackson. I knew Michael Jackson was innocent, and thank goodness the jury found him innocent. The real criminals in the case were the prosecution team, in my opinion. The fingerprint evidence was put on the magazine at a grand jury inquisition. The prosecution team handed the boy the magazine, and a juror said, shouldn't that boy be wearing gloves? Shouldn't that boy be wearing gloves? That's where the fingerprint evidence was presented to the magazine. The prosecution team then presented this evidence to a jury, which is knowingly committing a felony. Respectfully, Daniel L. Petrie. Because the same kind of cops are right here in Lombok. They're right here in Santa Barbara. They're right here in Santa Maria. And if you don't believe me, Welcome Dan Petrie to the show. Dan. Hey, nice to be back, Mr. Wagner. Are you glad to be back? I am, and I'm sorry for Mr. Thomas's heartbreak. And uh, like I was just mentioning, it's it's uh, mine's been going on for 30 years. So um, I feel sorry for what he's gone through, but I've gone through it for 30 years. So well, let's start um, at the top. This is your your time to tell tell right. America what they did to you right here. I am. First of all, I like to say who I am in my own words because I'm tired of the media making me out who I'm not, so I'm going to tell America who I am. My name is Dan Petrie and I live in Vandenberg Village, California. I am not the Dan Petrie that played for the Detroit Tigers. I was also an all-star pitcher for Cabrillo High School. When the other Dan Petrie was drafted, many people thought it was me. That is how good I was. There should have been and could have been easily two Dan Petries in the majors. What happened to me was when Dr. Gordon, a major league doctor that gives physicals and checks the overall condition of a major league prospect's arm and examined my arm in 1980, he discovered that and told me and all teams interested in me that I needed rotator cuff surgery on my throwing shoulder, thus my career and hopes of being drafted were over at 20 years old. Because in the late 70s, you did not come back from this kind of surgery. There was no miracle surgery in the 70s. A surgery like this ended your career. I've always wanted to meet the other Dan Petrie just so he knows there could have been two of us. This is the truth of what happened to me. I did not get all into drugs and ruin my baseball career, and I have passed every drug test I've ever taken since 1985, and where I live does not allow any illegal drugs, and there is absolutely no traffic. This is my story in my own words. My family moved to Vandenberg Village in 1966 because my father was in the Air Force, and we got stationed here from Japan. In fact, he is in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, for his heroics in World War II. So I come from a proud military family. What my father did was, him and his pilot took out two planes in Nazi Germany on their way to Spain. They were carrying Hitler's top lieutenants and documents of the Hitler regime. What my father and his, co and his pilot did was, they stopped the Nazi regime from taking and starting over in Spain. I am basically an expert on the Nazis because I've lived it my whole life. And that's a little bit about my father and why we got to, and I'm of course proud of my dad, what he did. He would never talk about his heroics. In fact, we didn't even know he did this great deed until he had passed away and was inducted into the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. That's the kind of hero he was. He never even mentioned it to the family. And in, in, uh, when I was 11 years old, I joined Village Hills Little League, and, and well, when I was eight years old, I joined Village Hills Little League, and it was probably its first or second year. The Little League was built by Village Realty. That's how long I've lived in Vandenberg Village. I just, I basically know the whole history of Vandenberg Village and Lompoc, because I've lived there since 66, or a lot of the history. At 12, I, at 11 years old, I made All-Stars. 
and I would continue to make All-Stars until I was 18. At 12 years old, we lost to a, a top pitcher from Fillmore, and when I was 14, I beat that pitcher from Fillmore in All-Stars. He then went on to be the single-A player of the year in high school. These are the kind of people that I beat growing up. If you don't believe I was one of the most feared pitchers to ever come out of Cabrillo or Lompoc, just ask Casey Candell, who played for the Astros and the Dodgers, or Jesse Orozco, the all-time appearance leader for saves uh, for pitchers, for relievers. All These are my friends. Just ask them. They'll tell you all about me. When I was 14, I made varsity. I was a sophomore. At the time, I was the youngest guy to ever be on varsity for Cabrillo, a storied baseball program, even though it was only in its early years. They had just had the number one draft pick the year before, in 1974, um, went to the Astros and the whole nation. My junior year, I pitched the one nothing win against Lompoc that they showed the picture of. That was the actual game picture from Lompoc when I beat Lompoc 1-0 in 1976 to win the Northern League Championship. I, I beat a great Lompoc pitcher, uh, Mick Schroll, and we have become friends over the years. He, we dueled it out. Some people claim it was the best baseball game ever between the two storied schools. I think it was because I was there. I lived it. It was like a football game, a baseball game with a football attendance. I then would go on to play All-Stars and make All-Stars, like I said, from 11 to 18. From 16 to 18, I played for Senior Baby with All-Stars, and I went approximately 10 and 1, and we came one game from the World Series all three years. I was one of the star pitchers. In other words, one game from the World Series, like I said. Okay. At 16, I also pitched against the Santa Maria Indians in a semi-pro team Lompo CAD. And I beat the Indians at 16 years old. I'm the youngest pitcher to ever beat the Indians. Scoob Nunes was, was with them way back then even. Jesse Orozco got the save in that game. He was 18, I was 16. That's why I know Jesse. We played together. At 20, my baseball career was over as stated. So I started playing slow pitch softball, and I coached and played until I was 32, earning many alternatives at third base. Even though I couldn't pitch anymore, I still had a rocket arm and could gun people at third, from third to first. And if you don't believe me, just ask me anybody who ever saw me play. My best alternative came when I was only 20 years old in the C-State Finals, where I was all tourney honors in the state at third base and mentioned in Slow Pitch Magazine. So even though I didn't make it to the pros, I still excelled at slow pitch. I played for 10 years. And then I started coaching the alumni game for Cabrillo. And a few years back, while I could still play at 45 years old, I doubled off the fence. And the Lompoc record did a story on how I still had it. I said, still had it. I never lost it, jokingly to the reporter. In 1989, I walked into a karaoke bar and fell in love with it. And I've been seeing karaoke ever since. You either love it or you don't. It's one of those things. In 1985, I started my own karaoke business and primarily at, at Butler Brothers in Lompoc. And then in 1995, I started my karaoke showcase at the Lompoc Flower Festival, which is now in its 16th year. I bring some of the best singers all over the central coast of Lompoc, and we opened the Flower Festival. Um, and then in 1992, I put together a state bowling team called the Magnificent Five. We, we got 11th in the whole state of probably 10,000 bowlers. And the last time I bowled in men's scratch league, I had a 945 four-game scratch series with a 298 high, followed by a 255. I took all monies at the end of the years against the best bowlers in Lompoc, which didn't make a lot of them too happy. But I've always been a very competitive person. I love my family greatly. And to all, so to all the haters and the liars that have spread lies about me and innuendos over the years, now you know the truth of me. I'm asking the media to tell the truth about what happened at Diablo in 1980 and who I really am. And thank you, Mr. Wagner. You're welcome, Dan. So that's your background. We, now we have a background. You could have been a great baseball player. Correct. You, you were a sportsman, a, a local celebrity. And that young lady that you married, she was pretty happy to have you. Right. When you got married. Yep. But then... Some scumbag was let out of prison. That's right. By the cops and the lawyers working together to use this scumbag. I think scumbag, seeing his rap record, is, is the proper. There's a very bad little black and white photo here. We really can't get very good shot That's of that. the fake ID given to him 
Really? And his real name wasn't Alan Christopher. That's his fake name given to him by the sheriffs of the state or whoever. I'm still not sure who yet. And that's but, what he looked like in 1984? So, wow, this is like more than 25 years ago? He doesn't hmm. look like that today if he's still alive. No, he's probably not even alive anymore. But probably drugged to death. And uh, this is his record. What was his real name? Leonard Lehane. Leonard Lehane. And why did they want to let him out of jail early to do what? Well, I got a job at Diablo Canyon. And for those of you that didn't see the show I was on before with him, I'll rephrase or recap a little bit what I said. Um, in 1980, I got a job at Diablo Canyon as a security guard, and I was newly married to one of the prettiest girls to ever come out of Lompo, California. I never say my wife's name or anyone in my family's name for their protection, obviously. I'm not going to do that. I'm not stupid. So this is, this is basically my fight for justice. So Leonard Lehane had an uh, arrest... In 71 in Massachusetts, yeah. two, three, four. His whole life. Five, six into 72. Career criminal. Uh, down to March of 72, unarmed robbery, mm -hmm. possession of heroin. Uh, this was a bad dude. Yeah. And they let him out of yeah, prison like locally it, and, and gave him a fake ID so he could rape your wife? Basically, they took a guy out of prison a career criminal that had committed numerous armed robberies and was a heroin addict. And they gave him a fake name and they planted him at Diablo Canyon and they gave him a job for Pullman Power. This is why my life's been in danger for 30 years because as a 20-year-old security guard working at Diablo Canyon, I witnessed this whole crime. I witnessed the crime spree. This is what I witnessed. People want more detail. This is exactly what I witnessed. Tell us. Okay. I knew he worked for Pullman Power because he would walk by me when I worked at my guard shack and he checked badges and I recognized him because he's a, a, one of the, the construction workers. So one day, my wife, we would be married about eight months and we saved our money and we didn't have very much money. We got our first apartment right in the middle of Pismo on Wadsworth and it's two blocks or so from the police station. Okay. So in about, in about our second week, my wife called me from Madonna Inn where she worked in the gift shop and they said, she said, there's this guy at the gift shop who's harassing her and being real sexual with her and would you please come and stop him or talk to him or something? And I said, okay, you know, honey, I'll be there. I was 8, 20 years old. And I come up and I confront this guy and I, and I recognize him as the construction worker that I'd seen at Diablo Canyon. And my wife made the mistake of giving him my name because he probably went up and talked to her and she, she probably said, yeah, my name's so-and-so. And she probably said, my husband works at Diablo, and he, she pro he probably said, well, so do I. And, you know, when you're friendly with somebody till you know him, she didn't know he was an undercover narc who was going to eventually, um, and there you see, that's how we looked at 20 and 18. There, that's our prom picture. So uh, just to show you how beautiful she was. And, you know, I hate having to show that picture, but it's the only way I can prove she was a beautiful girl, you know. And, and well, you're a pretty handsome dude there. Too. Well, that's when I was a star baseball player. So basically we were like, Prince William and Kate Middleton. I mean, to, to sum it up to the general public, we were a young, handsome um, couple. And what happened was this narc saw my wife and he said he's going to have her. And he, he, he almost did. He almost murdered me for her. Now, how that happened was I confronted him. And I said, will you please leave my wife alone? And he, he, he's like, yeah. He goes, well, I got the power to ruin your life, you know. And I didn't know what he was talking about. But now I, now I know what he was talking about. And he did ruin your life. Well, he did ruin my life. He, and, he, and he ruined my life because of all the corrupt police officers that work from basically Paso Robles to Santa Barbara. They're ridiculous corrupt. And uh, he couldn't have done it without him. He couldn't have done it without Tom Sned. And he couldn't have done it without, you know, uh, just, you know. That's why I've been trying to um, tell my story for so long. And I actually tried to testify in the Michael Jackson case because I know the police and Tom Sned and Lompo have some criminal elements. And, and I know because of my case, you know. And it's that simple. And I knew Michael Jackson was probably being railroaded. So I actually tried to get a hold of, of Mr. Mezzaro, um at the courthouse. But I was always, ref you know, people think you're nuts. They just, oh, you know, you don't want to see it. Well, if he, if he really wouldn't known my story, he would have saw me. <laughs> yeah, well, so, but cut to the chase. Let me get to what happened now. Okay, each time I got in, in contact with Leonard Lehane, who I didn't know was Leonard Lehane yet, I thought he was Alan Christopher, I would call the police and I would say, will you please come and arrest this guy? He's harassing my wife. He's stalking her. He won't leave her alone. And every time I talked to a dispatcher, he said, well, it's really nothing we can do right now. Well, I made the mistake of saying his name, Alan Christopher. So the dispatcher was thinking, gee, that's our narc. 
So he's probably out busting somebody for drugs, and, they, and so we're, just, we're not going to do anything. Well, that's not what he was doing. He had, no, he had no intention of busting people for drugs, okay, America? He'd been in prison most of his life. So when he got out of prison, he said, man, I'm just going to go target beautiful women. I don't care about busting people for drugs. <laughs> it's, it's obvious what he did. He took the opportunity to basically go on a rampage just like Charlie Manson would if he let Charlie Manson out. Let's let Charlie Manson out and see what he does. Well, what do you think he'd do? He'd probably go kill people again. Now, Dan, let me interrupt you for a second here because I want to clarify something. You call uh, this criminal a narc. Narcs are usually people who are actually employed and get... Yeah, he was employed by the Sheriff's Department. By the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department. No, the San Luis Sheriff's Department. I think San it's Luis for. Obispo. Well, yeah. good. Well, this wasn't. And how I can county. prove that is. But how can you prove that? Well, here's a falsified police report that Lahane did on me. Now, how he got this was, he actually followed my wife home one night from a dawn in around 10 o'clock at night, and she came into my house all hysterical, our first apartment on Wadsworth, and she said, "That guy that's been stalking me, he he, he followed me home and everything, and he, you know, I'm scared to death, and I don't know what's going to happen and everything. She's only 18, so." Now he knew where I lived. <laughs> now this was in 1980? Right. Now he knew where I lived. What's the date on this report? 8-7-1980. Right there. There it is, 1980. 1900 hours. So it's pretty late in the evening on a Thursday mm -hmm. on August 7th, which is just about exactly 31 years ago today. There you go, America. At a 20 -year -old, as a 20-year-old security guard, I was face to face with this guy here. Who had a long rap sheet. And my beautiful wife, okay? And the local cops. Wouldn't arrest him. The county sheriffs of San Luis Obispo were employing him, so they wouldn't touch him. That's right. Nobody you know, touched him. What it makes him. me want to do is investigate this uh, San Luis Obispo sheriff deputy, I think it was. Thomas was his name, who came from San Luis Obispo County to Santa Maria, booked into a hotel, and allegedly committed suicide. And allegedly, it was all bent out about his divorce. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. I haven't really investigated that case. And there's the case of Dolly Thomas. I don't know if she's any relation to this Thomas from San Luis that committed suicide. But Dolly Thomas, just to irritate the Sheriff's Department of Santa Barbara, I'll say it again, she was married to the Sheriff Thomas second wife, I believe, of Sheriff Thomas, who had already pretty much moved in with his girlfriend and she was suing for divorce. She had half his pension to gain. She had a house to gain. She loved her grandchildren. And they want me to believe, they want you to believe, if you even heard about Dolly's death, that she committed suicide by going in the garage, turning on the engine, and shutting the door, and just gassing herself to death. And I'm on record already of going on this show and saying, I think a different county should have had their coroner's department come in because our sheriff is also the top coroner. It's sheriff hyphen coroner election. And there's a conflict there. The conflict is so blatant. Now, I'm not saying that Dolly didn't commit suicide. I just find it highly suspicious because within days of her committing suicide, we had a scheduled appointment to do an interview on things to do with lots of different cases that she was going to tell me about. Except she didn't live, Dan, to tell me about. Well, that's why I'm going public on this whole case. Because I think it's good. I'm for 31 get... years, my life's been in danger over this case because the police, the police know I know what I know. They know I'm the eyewitness security guard to the whole crime and my testimony, if there's, a, if there's anything that goes on in this case, my testimony puts maybe 100 people in prison on this just this one case. And I'm talking police officers all over the Central Coast, um, prosecutors that have covered it up, attorneys that have uh, uh, taken money from victims from this case, a bail bondsman who've taken money from victims from this case. Where, what city is a bail bondsman from? Well, I got bail bonds out by uh, Kurt Moore and Lompoc years ago, and I mean, it's, it's just but been I mean, a nightmare. But I mean, the ones that, that are corrupt that you're referring well, to... Well, I hate to say the word corrupt with Kurt Moore because I don't really know that yet, but all I know is for 31 years I've basically been had this done to me. This was my latest ticket I was written. It was written in two, 219 of 11, and it's for not stopping at a stop sign. So basically what the police do 
is they constantly try to keep me, the victim, in trouble and let all the real criminals run around and do whatever they want. This is the okay. real criminal in my case. There's, there's a real criminal. But right. Curb Moore, the bail bondsman, you don't know that he did anything corrupt. No, I don't. All I know is he's the bail bondsman okay. involved in my case, so he, I don't want to assume anything there. Okay, so let's not put aspirations on him. Right. You, you said cops were involved, right. bail bondsmen, but we don't know that this bail bondsman... We don't know his exact... It, it, that where he, he, is he could have just been out to make a buck because that's what he's in business to right. do, make a buck. Right. Now that the he police, knows what he's involved with, I hope he realizes that I'm the victim and just leave me alone if he is involved in this case. So, but cut to the chase, get back to the story. Um, every time I got involved with Lahane, it escalated basically to the point of, you know, he was going to kill me and I was like, yeah, bring it on. It, was, it basically escalated. I was protecting my wife from this maniac at 20 years old. And I was trying to do my eight hour shift at Diablo and protect my wife at the same time for three days because I wouldn't get any help from the police because it wouldn't answer my 911 calls. So I've got an 18 year old wife who's terrified this guy's gonna basically rape and murder her and the police aren't helping me. I know what I'm up against and how I know what I'm up against is because I then, after, when I got off of work, I would stalk him. And I actually found out where he lived. They gave him an apartment in Avila and I actually followed him around one night and I saw a white car with a 38 revolver in the back seat of it. So I now knew he had access to, a, to at least a police-issued gun. Now, whether or not he ever had one, I don't know. I wasn't going to wait around to find out. How do you know it was a police-issued gun? Well, it was a white car, NARC car, and it, was a, it, was a, it looked like a 38 in the front seat. So, I mean, that, that doesn't that's, mean it was a police-issued right, gun. Right, but I mean, it was a... I it mean, was you're, a, you're accusing the San Luis Obispo... Uh, well, it was probably Nungary's gun. That was the sheriff he worked under, Sheriff Nungary. Nungary. Well, he's retired, isn't he? He's I had no gone. idea. No, he's no, he got fired. Gone. No, he didn't retire. I ruined his career. He's, he, he was fired a long time ago. Yeah, because I, of what? This case. I, because this of me case. going public on... But they still didn't arrest him? I have no idea. I don't know what's they going on with this case. All I know, nothing's going on with this case. All I know is this is what happens with this case. Well, there's they a new keep, sheriff in town. They keep targeting me. <gasps> but there's a new sheriff in San Luis Obispo, and maybe we ought to give the new sheriff the benefit of a doubt and ask him to go back and review files. Well, I've been trying to do that. I've been trying to get the new DA, Joyce Dudley, to prosecute all the real that's criminals in, this in the county. case. Right. She's, she's a gutless wonder in this town. She won't even act, go after Dan the Reamer. Dan Reamer, who my video clip is called Dan the Man, mm -hmm. and I had to scout him out, people. He was hiding in his Santa Barbara hilltop home, and I can't figure out, with as many ex-wives as he's got, <laughs> how he could buy a house worth about... Eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars, and buy it for six hundred thousand, and put in one point one million cash, roughly, which was almost double what he needed, in cash, cash, put in that much cash, and then take out like a half a million, and and get the house. Yeah. To me, that looks like you're whitewashing some dirty money and making it look like it came out yeah. of a real estate deal. Dudley won't even investigate him. And you have Dudley's opponent, Josh Lynn, who gave an $80,000 loan, because if it was not repaid, it's a gift, and you can't give that much. Yeah. So there's another Ill illegality. And I asked Josh Lynn. I, I, I saw Josh garbage. Lynn. Hey, I said, Josh, can I talk to you? Can I get you on record? No, and he runs away. This, yeah. These are our brave lawyers. I, I think we've got a cabal of criminals I think there's actually more honest cops than there are honest lawyers. You're down in the cops, but you know, my great granddaddy, Sheriff William Wagner, was an elected sheriff and he wasn't corrupt. He was a little rough around the edges and was known to snap people's neck if they got out of hand. He was a little rough, but he wasn't corrupt. Yeah. And I think it's the lawyers are corrupt. And then the cops say, well, look what the lawyers are getting yeah. away with. Well, I'll, be, well, I mean, I'll make that perfectly clear. You know, I'm not anti-police. We need them. I'm just anti-dirty We need. I'm just anti -dirty cops, that's all. And what I have against the good cops is, like he said, you need to arrest the bad ones, man. When they do what you they did to, to Kelly Thomas, it's your job to arrest those guys. But I want to get back, because people ask me about this case that's seen the show before, and they just, they're confused on some issues, okay? Go to it. Get to it. So what happened was, okay, I confronted him at Madonna Inn. He found out now where I live, so he falsified a police report on me that said I sold him $55 of marijuana, and it actually says I gave him $30 back, so the whole drug deal is for $25. So this, this $25 drug deal completely ruined my life. It's a joke. Did it ever happen? 
Did that never happen? I didn't want nothing to do with this narc. I was newly married. I was doing great at Diablo. Did you I was have one of their history? best new jobs. Did you have any history of smoking marijuana? No, I didn't. Either. I was never had been busted for pot. I was a star wouldn't, baseball player. Wouldn't somebody have noticed if you were high at working at Diablo as a security guard? Right, but not only somebody noticed. Not only that, you don't become an an MVP in my high school team twice, and have the career I had as a baseball player and be a drug addict or an alcoholic, man. I didn't have my first beer till I was completely done with baseball. I was over till I was probably like 22 years old. Wow. Does that look like a guy who was doing a bunch of drugs and drinking alcohol? No, I was running five miles a day. So if you pardon my anger, I am. You put on, you put on a little weight since then. Well, I quit playing ball. Well, I have a bad hip and I, and I have a bad ankle and a combination of not running anymore and those. Yeah, you, you know, I'm 51 now. I mean, I'm not a 16-year-old kid anymore, but... But cut to the chase, what he did was, once he found out my name and my address, he then falsified a police report on me to have me falsely arrested. His plan was to have me thrown into a jail cell for a little while, I don't know however long. And while I was in the jail cell, I would then be helpless to protect my 18-year-old wife. He could then rape and possibly murder her. And that's the truth of what happened at Diablo. So um, for then, um, but what did, happened was... He, he did put pressure on your wife, didn't he? <laughs> This case completely ruined my life. What kind of but, young marriage can handle this kind of pressure? And then you're dealing with a bunch of dirty cops who are just trying to cover it all up. You're trying to just go on with your life and get a job, and you've already lost your career at Diablo because you got... Well, I'll get to the whole thing. This is what people's things are. Okay? Here's an important point I think we need to restate here, Dan. The cops, not just once in a while, but routinely will take a career criminal out of prison and say, we'll give you easy time. Oh, yeah, do something. We'll, we'll put you on the payroll if you go get some other young guys to buy some pot or something, and we can make some more arrests. Yeah, yeah. They will do that. They do all and, kinds of and, stuff. And the feds do it, too. And they will take these scumbags, not thinking, oh, these scumbags just might rape a few people while they're out. It doesn't seem to occur to them. They don't to, care to the, the, the negative side. Yeah, I know. And people, That's why my life's been in danger, because I know all this. Well. You know? Well, it turns out there's another case exactly like your case. It happened about the same time, and we haven't had him on the show yet. But his case happened in 1981-82. And when he saw you on my show prior, he came forward. Good. We More people need to. We need to start documenting these people, and that's what I'm trying to do in the show. So you will know, and you, you out there, when you see a sheriff come up for re-election, you can put the thumb screws to him and say, okay, you're going to hire these criminals and put them on the payroll and let them out like this. What's his name? Leonard Lehane. Leonard Lehane. This is the fake ID given to Leonard Lehane with the name of Alan Christopher. His real name isn't Alan Christopher. It's Leonard Lehane. And... I still haven't figured out why they did this case. It's just ridiculous, asinine. I want to try to zoom in because you've got to be able to read that. It's kind of, yeah, that's cool. You can read it. A lot of people say you can't read it. I can't read it. It was armed robbery. This is Leonard Lehane's record of arrest. He was in Massachusetts, as you can see. He was a career criminal. Uh, newly released from prison, I guess. I don't even know why. I haven't figured this case out. But that's his record. Possession of heroin. Unarmed robbery, armed robbery, armed robbery, armed robbery, armed robbery, armed robbery. This is the undercover narc I was up against at 20 years old and newly married who tried to rape my 18-year-old wife. And that's the truth of what happened at Diablo, 1980. I saved my wife's life, but I was fired from Diablo for not showing up to work because I was too busy protecting my 18-year-old wife from being raped by this narc. I had nothing to do with drugs. We weren't even involved in drugs. It's ridiculous. Um, there's his record. I was a... Uh, all-star baseball player from the Lompoc Valley, as I stated in the my show. Um, newly married, everything to live for, and this narc just ruined my life. So not only did he ruin my life, he ruined at least two families. He probably ruined as many as 20 families. I don't know. We'll never know. But I know he ruined at least two families forever. This is the witness nabbed in the San Luis Tribune paper in 1981. It says, witness nabbed arrest Cloud's testimony, and if you read it, it says, the sheriff's department took Alan Christopher, uh, Leonard Lehane out of prison and gave him a fake name, Alan Christopher. I just showed you that evidence. This is why my, my life's been in danger for 33 years in this case, because I have the evidence on a corrupt government narc.
who the police took out of prison. I don't know if they took him out of prison to rape and murder people on purpose or if that's just how it ended up, but I stopped it as a 20-year-old newly married security guard. I just wish it hadn't ruined my life for doing the right thing. That's why I started this show, Cops, because I was an honest security guard who did the right thing. <clears throat> and the law enforcement community, you know, ruined me for doing it. So this is my lawsuit in the paper filed by Patricia Berry of Lomita against Lompoc. It says Vandenberg Village Man files million dollar damages city against city and the Lompoc record would never tell why I filed the suit, which you guys have now seen why. They, I guess they would rather have a corrupt government narc running around trying to rape and murder people than warn the public. So I had to do it like Paul Revere. I had to run around and warn everybody. So it's kind of how I always looked at this case. You know, I, I ran around and warned everybody. You know, you got this, these dirty cops on the street. Okay, this is proof I sought FBI protection from some of the most corrupt police officers in the history of mankind that work out of the Lompoc Valley. Uh, basically from Paso Robles to Ventura. And in my opinion, they should fire every police officer between Paso Robles and Ventura because they're that corrupt. So, um, but this is the FBI protected paperwork. It says, this letter is in response to a complaint which you filed against numerous Santa Barbara sheriffs and Vandenberg police officers. Um, and it's signed, uh, it's Charlie Parsons and Special Agent Gregory uh, Mercier, it looks like, Mercier. And that is the official FBI protected paperwork that I carry with me to prove to everybody that I am under FBI protection in the case. I've had to seek FBI protection over 10 times in my life because of this case, because of all the people, it could be as many as 200 people that would like to see me, you know, not make it to the next day, so. Hello America and the world, it's Dan Petrie once again. After watching my interview with Mr. William Wagner, who was the first journalist to let me show all the evidence on the truth of what happened at Diablo Canyon in 1980. Now you see why I'm an advocate and have been for over 33 years for victims of police crimes, because I am one. Peace.